Hello, U.S. History. I'm back. I'll try to be a little less long-winded this time. I make no promises. Um, if you turn in your notes packet to the next section, the one that says the Articles of Confederation, um, we're going to try to cover all of that in one sitting, and I'll try to not make it last 40 minutes. Again, I make no promises. Okay, the Articles of Confederation, you might remember from your civics class in middle school, um, the Articles of Confederation was the very first governing document that the United States ever operated under. It's not a very good government. You're going to see it has a lot of weaknesses, and actually those weaknesses were put in place on purpose. Um, so if Ms. Pfizer could go ahead and turn to the second slide in the PowerPoint, um, you'll notice right here it, it explains how we came up with it. All right, so in 1776... We officially declared to Britain that we were going to be a new and independent nation. We wrote the Declaration of Independence. We sent a copy to King George III. I'm sure he wasn't very happy about it. But from our perspective, we now were no longer colonies. We are now a nation, and we need to form a new national government. So the Second Continental Congress... Um, pr proposed that all the colonies get rid of their colonial documents, obviously, because now they're going to be states. So every state was ordered to draft a new constitution, and we have to create a new national government. Now, they start in 1777 uh, to create the Articles of Confederation. It's not officially ratified or approved until 1781. It is a wartime document. Um, so the fact that they're kind of creating it hastily or quickly during wartime probably didn't help anything. And if you also think about it, we were breaking away from a country um, that we felt was very overbearing and very oppressive. So we're going to try to go in the complete opposite direction and create a, a national government that really has little little to no power over us, especially when it comes to money issues. Um so that's the Articles of Confederation. Now, in the, the title, it, it, it tells you what kind of government it actually is. A confederation is when you have a loose alliance of independent states. So if we're 13 states now, we're not colonies anymore, if we're 13 states, we want each of those 13 states to really rule itself, and we're only going to be connected together under a national government in times of crisis. So it's almost like a, a, a friendship league or something. We're only going to, you know, help each other fight wars or, or draft international treaties. But Virginia, for the most part, will rule Virginia and Maryland will rule Maryland and so on and so forth. Um, if you look at the next slide, it explains how those state governments are structured. The state governments are structured um, exactly like they are today. And in fact, if you look at the state constitutions that were drafted in 1776 and 1777, they look like the government that we operate under nationally today. There are typically three branches. You have the executive branch where there's somebody to enforce the law, in this case a governor. You have um, a legislative branch or a lawmaking body, so like um, in Virginia it would be the House of Burgesses. And then you have a judicial branch. You have some kind of state-level court that will make sure that the, the laws are um, fair and that people are uh, abiding by those laws. Um, some states even draft a Bill of Rights, a Bill of Rights is a list of rights or freedoms that belong to the people of that state that um, cannot be taken away by the state government or cannot be abused by the state government. There was a Virginia Bill of Rights, which you do need to know. Um, a man named George Mason wrote it. It was called the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and it was written in 1776. And um, it will be the basis of our National Bill of Rights when we finally do draft one. So thank you, George Mason, for that. Um, you'll see that some states start to create laws that um, implement a practice of separation of church and state. Uh, Virginia was one of those states. Um, Thomas Jefferson came up with a law, I want to say in 1786, um, that date's sticking in my mind, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, it was called the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, 
And um, what it did was it outlawed having an official church for the state of Virginia. If you go back to when we were colonies, our official religion was the Anglican Church. The Virginia was a southern colony. Southern colonies stayed like England. So uh, everybody was kind of expected to practice the Anglican faith. And in fact, it was written into our colonial charter. Well, when Jefferson started looking at that, he felt that that violated people's freedom. Even even though there wasn't necessarily persecution against other Christians, um, he knew that if people um, saw that Virginia said that, hey, the Church of England's our official church, then they might feel obligated to practice that faith, and he felt that, that was wrong, that we there shouldn't be one um, religion that outweighs the other. So he outlawed having an official church, and that practice will continue on to the national level a little bit later on. But So you need to know Jefferson's Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. You need to know George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights. Um, and all states wish to keep their sovereignty. That, that means that they want to keep power over them um, over themselves. They don't want the national government to really have much power over them. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that there are three different types of sovereignty listed. Now, sovereignty is just one of those fancy history words that means power. Um, so we're looking at three different type of governing power structures. Um, now, the one that we pick with the Articles of Confederation is the first one, Confederation. It's a loose alliance of 13 independent states. They're only kind of connected together in case there's a crisis or something. And um, just to make you really hungry this morning, um, we're describing them like desserts. So Confederation is like a plate of cookies, okay? It's like we have uh, 13 different cookies on this plate together. Yeah, it's like one dessert, but they're individual desserts. We can kind of pass out the cookies to everybody, right? Um, now, the reason why we picked the Confederation is because if you look at the bottom of the list, um, kind of the exact opposite of a Confederation is a unitary government. And in this case, we're saying that a unitary government is a pound cake, which is delicious. I mean, I've had really a really good pound cake before, but it's just, it's just a, a cake, right? There's like not much to it. It's just a solid cake, maybe some glaze on it or whatever. And a unitary government is what we had under King George III. He was pretty much an absolute ruler. That's kind of oversimplifying it. But King George III had all the power. He, uh, We felt that he abused his power, and we didn't want to have all the power singularly in one person or one group of people at the national level. So that's why under the Articles we went in the exact opposite direction, and we created a confederation. Now you notice in the middle, we just skipped over that, um, um, the middle is a federation, and that's what we have today. Eventually, we realized that unitary kind of sucks, but confederation kind of sucks too. Um, so the feder federal model is what we have today, and I, I say it's like a layer cake. Um, let's pretend like we have a, a yellow cake with chocolate frosting, and you have three layers of yellow cake, and they're all connected together with that chocolate frosting. Doesn't that sound really good? Well, that's kind of what we have today, right? We have um, three separate levels of power. We have local governments that can do certain things, and then we have state governments that can do certain things, and then we have a national government that has certain powers reserved to it. And so there's a little bit of power at each one, but they're sort of connected together. So eventually we'll realize that that's a, a much better model um, than what we had either way, either the unitary under King George or the Confederate model under the Articles. All right, if you go on to the next slide, you'll see that... Um, well, in here in just a second, I'm going to tell you how awful the Articles of Confederation actually was. It's a, it's a really crap government. Sorry, sorry, Second Con Continental Congress, but you got it wrong. Um, but there are a couple good things that do come about underneath this government, and you especially need to know it if you're taking the AP test, because you might have an essay question or, or something along those lines. Lines. Um, if you look on this slide, there are three key things that you need to know that happen under the Articles of Confederation. The first thing, the uh, Revolutionary War officially ends. It's under the, the government that operates under the Articles of Confederation that we ratify the, um, the Treaty of Paris of 1783, which recognized America as a country. It specified our boundaries. This is the document that we signed when we sent diplomats to Paris to go and, you know, uh, I guess, have us be internationally recognized as a nation. So that's the first good thing that it did. It uh, got the official recognition, uh, recognition sorry, of America across the world. 
Okay, and then you'll notice that the next two laws kind of deal with that. With the Treaty of Paris of 1783, America now expands from or exists from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. And um, now that we own all that land, we can start to send people out west to live on that land. Because if you remember, when we were still colonies, King George had a law passed called the Proclamation of 1763 that drew a line along the Appalachian Mountains and told the colonies that they couldn't move west of that line. So uh, while a couple people did move past the Appalachian Mountains and they are living in the Ohio River Valley, there's still a lot of unclaimed territory that now the United States owns. Well, the great thing about owning land, you can sell it. And if you sell it, you can make some money. And at the end of the Revolutionary War, the United States is crazy in debt because we still owe Britain money, according to the Treaty of Paris. We have to pay back money that France gave us and Spain gave us and the Netherlands gave us. You're also going to see that we printed a whole bunch of worthless money during the Revolutionary War. So America is broke as a joke. And so now that we own this land, we can send surveyors out west to figure out how much land it is that we own so we can start plotting it off so that we can sell it. And that's what the Land Ordinance of 1785 did. We sent surveyors out west. Those are the people who measure the land. They took all that land and they blocked it off into townships, which are these squares that are six miles by six miles. So inside is 36 square miles of land, and they would break it down into... Um, I, I want to say, oh, I, I'm totally going to get this wrong, 640 acre plots, um, or maybe it's 360 acre plots. Either way, I would never ask you that. And um, that way, we had these little plot that we, plots that we could sell to people. Now, some of the land was reserved for Revolutionary War veterans because they were going to get it as a pension, as sort of a, a retirement gift. Some of the plots were reserved so that we could build schools and post offices and town halls and stuff as people move out west. Um, but the vast majority of the land can be sold. And that way, the U.S. government can make some money so we can pay off that war debt. All right. Now, the third law on that um, PowerPoint deals with this pe with the people moving out west. As we sell the land and all these thousands of people are moving out west, we have to figure out how that land will enter into our country as territory and how the territories will enter our country as states. Um, so the Northwest Ordinance will set up the outlines for statehood. Once 5,000 eligible voting age males move to an area, then the area could, ap could apply to become an official territory. And as a territory, they would form a, they would write a territorial constitution and they would kind of rule themselves. And then once I think it was 50,000 voting age males, one, once 50,000 voting age males moved to the area, then they could apply to become a state. Uh, and then they would write a state constitution that would be submitted to Congress and then that way they would um, enter into the Union. I think about 12 states entered the United States under this law. So it's by far the most successful law that happened under the Articles of Confederation. All right, so those are the three good things that happen under the Articles of Confederation. If you go to the next slide, though, we're going to start to see a lot of the problems. Okay, And one of the biggest problems that is connected to the Articles is money. We have a lot of money problems under the Articles of Confederation. Like I already mentioned, we owe money to Britain because um, of contractual agreements that we made under the Treaty of Paris. Um, we owe money to Spain and the Netherlands and France because they loaned it to us in order to win the American Revolution. We also, during the war, printed this currency called Continental Dollars, but um, it's kind of like what happened in Germany at the end of World War I. Um, we practiced hyperinflation. We printed a whole bunch of money, but didn't have the gold or silver to back up that paper currency, so it's not even really worth the paper that it's printed on. Um, so a lot of states start printing their own money, so we're going to have a lot of currency exchange issues. Um, so that's just the icing on the cake. There's a lot of, a lot of financial stuff that's going on with the Articles of Confederation. We are super poor. If you turn to the next slide, you'll see even more weaknesses that we have. There's a big long list. Um, at the top you got all that, that wealth issue stuff, the fact that we're so poor. But then the second one listed is the most important. This is the one the, that the SOLs would ask you. 
the biggest weakness of the Articles of Confederation is the fact that written into that document, the national government has no power to tax its people. Great idea in theory, right? Wouldn't you love to keep all your money and make sure that the national government couldn't take it? I would too. However, in order for a government to run, it needs cash. And our national government cannot tax the people under the Articles. So if they're poor, they cannot operate. Now there are some loopholes. The state governments can tax, and state governments are kind of responsible for giving money to the national government, but it's all kind of voluntary. Um, you have to uh, rely on the states to be forthcoming and be willing to give over this money to the national government. They're not necessarily going to be forced to do so. So no power to tax. And that was done on purpose because we felt that George III and Parliament had abused their power to tax, right? No, pa no taxation without representation. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that never happened to us again. So we write that into the articles, no power to tax. So there are some structural issues with the Articles of Confederation. At the national level, we only have one branch of government. We have a legislative branch. We have a Congress, and that's it. There's no executive branch, and that's done on purpose. We didn't want to create a position anywhere near a king because we were, we were afraid if we created that position that somebody um, would start to abuse that power. There's no judicial branch. We figure we'll let the states... Uh, try their own laws. So all we have is a Congress. But even within that Congress, there are some serious structural issues. Um, for example, each state only got one vote. Now you could send anywhere from two to seven representatives per state, um, but no matter how big nor how small your state was, every state only got one vote. Now if you're a little state like Rhode Island or Connecticut, you think that that's probably awesome. If you're a big state like Virginia or Pennsylvania or New York, you feel like you're getting ripped off because you have four, five, six times the amount of people as Rhode Island, yet your vote counts exactly the same. So that's a problem. Um, we also see there's issues with getting laws passed. You need nine out of 13 states in order to vote yes to pass a law. That's roughly 70%. That's way over majority, so that's probably another reason why there's not very many laws that we learn about from the Articles of Confederation. Um, if you want to make changes to the Articles of Confederation, if you want to make an amendment, you have to have 13 out of 13 states vote in favor of that change. So guess how many amendments there are? Zero. You're right. It's difficult to get 100% of people to do anything um, so that no amendments were ever added to the Articles of Confederation. All right, other things. You can't solve problems between states. So um, let's say, for example, Maryland and Virginia are fighting over control of the Potomac River, which actually did happen, by the way. Um, if, if Maryland and Virginia decided to have a civil war over this river, which they don't, but if they did, the national government could not step in and solve it. These two states would just fight over this body of water. There's no way the national government can get involved. If, um, if America wanted to create a trade agreement with Spain and every state except Georgia wanted to follow this trade agreement, Georgia wouldn't have to. You can't force Georgia to honor a treaty. Um, the U.S. government can have a military, uh, but they can't draft anybody into it. So you can see how the, the problems are mounting. We have created a national government with its hands tied behind its back. It can't do anything to, to make sure that our, our security or our welfare is really taken care of. But if you think about where the colonies were coming from, you can maybe see why they were so afraid of putting power at the national level. Um, the next slide just shows you a, a little bit more. It's a more visual description of the problems with the Articles of Confederation. You'll notice that the big one there is no power to tax. And that's the one that you would probably be asked on a test, either AP or SOL. All right, and then um, our last slide. Yay, we did this fast. I'm so happy. Um, our last slide um, is really the event that showed us how weak the Articles of Confederation actually was. It's Shays' Rebellion. Um, Shays' Rebellion takes place in Massachusetts. You have a Revolutionary War veteran named Daniel Shays, and he fought in the war. He was just a regular Joe Farmer. He comes back home to Massachusetts after the United States has won independence, and he's not really happy with the state of things because even though the national government cannot tax the people under the Articles of Confederation, the states can, and they are. 
States are heavily taxing the people in order to help the national government pay off its war debt. Um, now, the way it worked, um, the national government kind of collected quarterly payments from the states. Now, some states pay their debts off really quick. I'm sure you can guess where. States in the South, like Virginia, they're debt-free like almost immediately because they are so wealthy. States like Massachusetts, however, are struggling. So they're going to put in crazy high taxes. And their taxes aren't just taxes. You have to pay those um, debts off in gold or silver. No paper currency because the paper money has no value. And no bartering system. Back in colonial times, you used to be able to, like, give a cow to the government and then they would like figure out how much the cow was worth and they would take that off your debt or whatever well now you can't do that you have to pay off your debts in gold or silver well I don't know about you but I don't just have a random closet full of gold in my house so that's a problem for people to come up with ways to pay off these debts and if you didn't pay off your tax debt you would lose your property you would get your house foreclosed on or the bank would come and take your farm or whatever. So you have all these people who went and fought the Revolutionary War. They fought the war against unfair taxation and now they come back home and they're facing what? Unfair taxation. So Daniel, Sh da Daniel Shays decides enough is enough and he is going to organize this rebellion. He's going to get hundreds of followers angry farmers with pitchforks essentially and they're going to march on Boston and they're going to take over the state government of Massachusetts. They're going to hold the government hostage. What can the national government do about this? Absolutely nothing. And the reason why? We have the Articles of Confederation and the U.S. government is not allowed to get involved in interstate disputes. If there's something internally going on in a state, the national government's hands are tied. They cannot get involved. So for like eight weeks, the, the state of Massachusetts is on lockdown and this rebellion has taken over and the state government cannot operate itself. Now, eventually, uh, George Washington figures out a way, he figures out some kind of loophole to go up to Massachusetts and stop the rebellion, but the damage has been done. People across the country are alarmed because they see just how weak the Articles of Confederation actually is. And they decide, you know what, we got to make a change. This government's not working. We need to come up with something a little bit better. So a couple months later, we're going to see that 55 guys from across the country are going to gather together in Philadelphia. They're going to draft the government that we are still operating under today. So thank you to Shays Rebellion for helping to form the U.S. Constitution. And we'll be talking about that in the next lecture. Um, hope this one was better. This one was like maybe, what, 20 minutes or so? Right on. I'm figuring out a way to make it short but sweet. Hope you guys are doing well. I'll see you soon. Bye.